to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Welcome to our study of the book Revelation. In this lesson, we're going to be examining chapters 12 through chapter 22 and looking at the main theme in each chapter, the main idea, and noticing how that ties into the overall message of God offering Christians help and encouragement during time of persecution by the Roman government. In chapter 12, we are presented with this image of the dragon, the woman, and the child. We know Revelation 12 verse 9 tells us that this dragon is none other than the devil himself. But who is this woman and who is this child that the dragon is trying to consume? Well, we learn about the child that he is one who is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 12 tells us. This takes us back to Psalm 2 verse 9 where we learn that that's a prophecy about Jesus ruling and reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is this woman then? Well, it is the woman who gives birth to the child. Most believe that the woman is Old Testament Israel, the faithful remnant in Old Testament Israel from which the seed, the Christ, came. In Genesis 3 verse 15, it was promised that the seed of woman would deal a death blow to Satan. It is the seed of woman here who defeats the dragon, and it's Old Testament Israel and the faithful remnant who prepared the way. For Jesus, the child, the Son of God, to come. It's prophesied in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 14, that one of the throne of David, or of the seed of David, would rule and reign over God's kingdom forever. We learn that that is Jesus. Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, He shall be called great, Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so the faithful remnant of Old Testament Israel, those who through, through whom God was working His purpose, now out of that, Jesus comes. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, I didn't come to destroy the law, but rather to fulfill it. He said, not one jot or tittle will, be, will pass away until all is fulfilled. And so Jesus, having come through the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament, now as the Son of God arises, and it is He through whom which the devil is defeated. Here's the lesson for us. My friends, if we're children of God, we can defeat the devil and we can be a part of God's eternal scheme to save man. We can have the access to the blood of Christ, which is able to, for, to wash us from our sins. But how do we, through Jesus, overcome the devil? How can I defeat the devil in my life today? I believe one of the most practical verses in all of Revelation is found in Revelation 12, verse 11. Here is a threefold way by which we can overcome Satan. Notice what this wonderful verse says. The Bible says, And they, first century Christians, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. A threefold way. They overcame him by sacrifice, Scripture and self-sacrifice. Think about that. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. What was it that defeated the devil, the one who looked like he had the power of death? The Bible says in Hebrews 2 verse 14, Jesus through death conquered him with the power of death who is the devil. And so it was the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' sacrifice is that death blow that was promised in Genesis 3 verse 15. Notice also they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony is what we have today recorded in Scripture. It is God's inspired word. And it is the word of God today where we find the power of salvation. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. The word of God is living and powerful today. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, And... 
The half-brother of the Lord said in James 1.21, we need to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Peter himself said in 1 Peter 1 verses 23 through 25 that we're born again by the word of God. And so they overcame him by the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus dying on the cross, being in obedience to the word of God. But notice that third characteristic, sacrifice, scripture, and self-sacrifice. Friend, even if we obey the gospel, even if we realize the importance of the sacrifice of Jesus in our life and become Christians, obey the word of God, if we fail to make self-sacrifice for Christ a, a part of our life, we'll not be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that you are bought at a price, that you're not your own? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. My life now as a child of God belongs to Christ, and I must be willing to sacrifice self for God. Remember Romans 12, verse 1. Christians are told to live as a living sacrifice. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And so we can overcome the devil through the sacrifice of Jesus, by obedience to the scriptures and by living a life of self-sacrifice. As we turn our attention to chapter 13, the writer now as he introduces us to the sea beast whom we identified as Rome and her rulers and the land beast, the militia who went around setting up images and enforced emperor worship, we now come to this scene in which there is a number that has become so popular in our world that it deserves some attention. That is the number 666. Notice what is said in Revelation 13 and verse 18. In this scene, identifying the land beast and the sea beast, we're told that there is a sign. Here it is, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. If the number 7 represents that which is complete, that number represents that which is perfect, that which is whole, then the number 6 falls one short of seven. Is this number 666 some mathematical calculation where we have to bring algebra and trigonometry and all these factors in together and somehow pop out some magic calculation? That's not what God's saying. The number six is one less than seven. Seven's perfect. If six is one less than seven, it is a number of imperfection. And look at how it is multiplied. Imperfection, imperfection, imperfection. That's the idea. This man, this Roman government, the Roman empires, they are the complete and utter embodiment, personification of human imperfection, human sinfulness. And so here this number 666 is not some literal number on people's heads. It's not a social security number as some have tried to push in the past. It just represents the imperfection of man, his sinfulness, and especially those who are going around enforcing emperor worship. Without God in our life, there will be no salvation. If we look to man for our salvation, our salvation will be imperfect. And so it is a sign of utter and complete imperfection. The imperfection of man and his sinfulness outside of Jesus, and especially in the context of the sea beast and the land beast, those who are enforcing emperor worship. Now we turn our attention to chapter 14, and here we're going to be uh, envisioning and seeing this 144,000. If there's a first popular number in the book of Revelation, it is the number 666. But along those lines, people are often talk about the 144,000. You ever had someone come to your door and say, are you sure you're a part of the 144,000? As though this 144,000 is literal, and I've got to be a part of that literal number, and, and these are people whom God is numbering today in a literal sense. That's not what's being said here. I want you to notice something very interesting about this 144,000. In Revelation, if this is a literal number to be taken literally, let's take the rest of it literally. Revelation 7 verse 4 says, these were Jews only. Revelation 14 verse 4, they had not been defiled by women, they were virgins. In Revelation 14, verse 4, having not been defiled by women, we learn they are males. If we're going to take it literally, let's take all of it literally. Those who are part of the 144,000 are Jews, they're virgins, they're males. Now, how many people are going to buy into that today? On those passages, we realize that's not literal. The 144,000 is not literal. Them being Jews, being virgins, males, that's all about their purity. 
None of this is to be taken as a literal 144,000. Rather, the number 12 represents humanity. If you take 12 and multiply that, here you come up with, at the end result, 144,000, a large number of the redeemed of the ages. This number just represents all of humanity who has decided to obey God's will and to become children of God. Not as though if you don't get in quick, you're going to miss out. We're at number 143,999 and you better get in. That's not what's being said. It's the redeemed of all the ages who have obeyed God and who are living faithful to Him. But in the midst of this redeeming of the ages, in the midst of these 144,000, I want you to notice a very encouraging verse. Look in Revelation 14, verse 13. This is another extremely encouraging verse in the book of Revelation. To Christians who are suffering, some who have seen family members die for the cause of Christ, here's what they're told. Revelation 14, verse 13, the scripture says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. These redeemed need to know that even if you die for the cause of Christ, you can still be blessed in your death. Death is not the worst thing to happen. In fact, did you know that you can't get to heaven without dying first? Death is one of the great things for a child of God. If I'm living faithfully as a Christian, death is not a bad thing. Death is a wonderful thing. The scriptures do not place the black, the cold, the dreary view of death that we often look at in this world. Death is viewed as wonderful. Listen to the words of Psalm 116, verse 15. The Bible view of death is this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's how God views it. When one of his children dies who has lived faithfully, even though they may have died at the hands of an evil Roman government, that's only a blessing for them. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Revelation 14, verse 13. Think about what Paul said in Philippians 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ. And what is death? And death. It's only a game. Death is a wonderful thing for the, for the child of God who's lived faithfully because he's had his sins washed away. He's got the hope that as he walks in the light, he's in fellowship with God, and he's got the promise of eternal life. Matthew 25, 46, 1 John 2, verse 25. And so Revelation 14, verse 13 is so encouraging and so practical for us. We must be faithful unto death, and then our God will give us the crown of life. Now saints are introduced to the song of Moses and the Lamb. In chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. Here you've got this prelude to more bowls of judgment, more of God's wrath being poured out of the bowls on the ungodly men. And prior to that, the saints are rejoicing. The song of Moses brings to our mind Exodus chapter 15. The people have escaped from Egyptian bondage. They were under horrible tyranny under Pharaoh, a hard taskmaster. God delivers them through the ten plagues. They, they go through the Red Sea on dry land. The uh, Egyptians are crushed by the waters, and they, they come out of that victoriously. That great time of tribulation and trouble, they arise out of that, and God's people overcome, and they come out in a, in a, a triumphant way. And so then they sing the song of Moses. But now they're not just singing the song of Moses. They're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Just like Moses led God's people out of Egyptian bondage to the promised land, the Lamb, the point is for these people, the Lamb, if you will follow Him as people followed Moses, and even more so, if you'll follow the Lamb faithfully, He can lead you out of this tribulation, out of these trials by the Roman government, and in the end, you'll be victorious. You'll be able to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And so here is another sign of God's victory, how He is going to lead His people faithfully, how that if they trust in Him, they will be victorious on the other side. And so a great comfort is given to these people. Chapter 16, we come to the seven bowls of judgment. God is again pouring out His judgment on the Roman Empire for their sin, for their wickedness, for their punishment of Christians. And again, not going into each bowl in detail, but God 
through natural means, is punishing Rome for her sins. And there is going to be a great battle that occurs in Revelation 16, probably one of the more well-known battles in all the Bible. Revelation 16, we're going to learn now about the battle of Armageddon. You hear so much today about Armageddon, how that it is a future battle in which God and His saints are going to go to war against all the ungodly. They're going to be victorious. They're now going to reign for a thousand years as kings and princes in some kind of utopia state here on the earth. Friends, let's remember some of the main keys at this point. The book of Revelation is a symbolic book. A real battle is not going to be pictured in this symbolic book. And let's remember, these are things which must shortly take place. Revelation 1, verse 1, the time is near or at hand. Revelation 1, verse 3. And so whatever battle is going to occur, it's going to happen in the time period of the people who first read this, the time period of the first century. And it's not really a battle that's going to happen anyway. For if you look in Revelation 16, 16, look at all that's said about this. Revelation 16, 16 says this, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And that's, that's what's said about the battle of Armageddon in this book. Now, what does the word Armageddon mean? The word Armageddon literally means hill of Megiddo. It ought to take our minds back as this imagery was written to Christians, some of whom have come out of Old Testament Israel. It would take their mind back to a famous battle in the Old Testament. You need to make a note of Judges 5 verse 19. God's people are now going to battle against the kings of Canaan. In Judges 5 verse 19, that battle occurs at the hill of Megiddo. God and His people conquer and they're victorious. Why were they victorious? Because God was on their side. He had already told them he'd, they'd win the battle. They trusted God and followed Him and all went well. The battle was pretty much over before it even started. And that's the case here in Revelation 16, verse 16. The evil nations are rising up against God and His people. They're gathered together as though they were at the hill of Megiddo. Christians and God win and they're victorious. Not a physical battle, but a battle in which God's people overcome because God is in control and He's the winner. And so all that you hear about the Battle of Armageddon deals much with the fairy tales that we talked about, how people use this book as a launching pad for things that God never intended for it to be. But in Revelation 17, now we're going to turn our attention to the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who will overcome. And so there's this great battle. God and His people are victorious. And now our attention is directed to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who leads His people, God's people, valiantly into overcoming. Now, watch what Revelation 17, verse 14 says about this one. The Bible said, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Why? He is Lord of all lords, he is the king of all kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. As we said, the battle's over before it even started. God and his people are going to be victorious. Christ is as though leading this army. He's the captain of the Lord's army, Hebrews 10, verses 9 and 10. We've been given the perfect spiritual armor, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. We've been promised that we will be victorious, Hebrews 2, 14, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Christ always leads us in triumph the Bible tells us, and thus here it is no surprise. The Lamb, Jesus, and those who follow Him will overcome Rome and the Roman government. They will arise out of this persecution victorious. What's the message for us today? Friend, when we pay, face tribulation, when, when evil opposes Christianity, whether it be an evil government which we live in today, whether it be atheism, humanism, postmodernism, when things rise up against Christ and Christianity, Christ and the faithful will always win the battle. The battle has already been won. If we make sure we're on God's side, we will overcome. Why is that? Because Jesus is Lord of all lords. He's King of all kings. There is no one greater than the Lord Himself. His majesty, His power, his ability to lead us to heaven, no one can even compare with Jesus, the great captain of the Lord's army. And so, yes, we will be victorious, but we must make sure we're a part of the faithful, we're a part of God's chosen. In Revelation 18, then, we're introduced after this battle occurs, or as the battle is occurring, we're introduced to, as well, the fall of Babylon. 
In our second lesson, we identified from the characteristics that Babylon the Great and the Great Harlot, both because of their characteristics, represent Rome. Christians, no doubt, are going to be wondering, what is God going to do to Rome? God's already told them, you just wait a little while. I'm going to reap my vengeance on Rome. We've seen the seven bowls of God's judgment. We've seen the, uh, the trumpets arising. We've seen how God has promised it's going to happen. God now here tells us that Rome is going to fall. Christianity is going to arise. It's going to be resurrected. It will live and rule forever. But Rome and her government is not going to rule forever. Notice Revelation 18, verse 10. I believe this is essential to our understanding how Christians were encouraged by God. What happens to Rome? The Bible says, They saw the smoke for burning, verse 9, and standing at a distance for fear of her torment, people were saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, your judgment has come. Look at the power of God and the completion of His promises here. People are standing back at a distance. They didn't want to get close. It's so bad. And what are they saying? At last it's happened. That great city has fallen. In one hour, that great city fell. Look at the quickness, the swiftness, the power of God in destroying Rome. Friends, history records that Rome was destroyed and that their evil ways were finished. God's kingdom, the church, is still reigning today. Here's a powerful tribute to the Word of God, to the book of Revelation, and to Jesus Christ today. Just as it was promised, Rome was destroyed. But look at the Lord's church today. It flourishes. It grows. The Word of God grew, grew and multiplied in Acts 12, verse 25. And friends, Rome has been long forgotten. But the church of the Lord is still ruling and reigning in the hearts and lives of men and women today. And so again, the lesson being, let's make sure that we're a part of the most important kingdom of all, the kingdom of Christ, not a kingdom uh, in physical location or physical things, but a spiritual rule and reign in the hearts and lives of men and women today. Now in chapters 19 through 22, they kind of like the battle is over and now God's going to tell us what's going to happen to the enemies and what's going to happen to the redeemed. In chapter 19, we learn that there's going to be a defeat of Satan. We learn that Jesus here is identified as both King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the victorious one. The dragon is defeated. Rome is thrown down. Christ is exalted and Christians will live and rule and reign forever. Look at Revelation 19 and verse 16. What a tribute to the power of the Lord. The Bible says that he, the one who was on a white horse, the one who was faithful and true, he, the one who struck down all nations, has on a robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Again, Jesus is the one who was conquering. He's the victorious one. As you think about chapter 20, there is this great scene of the binding of Satan. Satan was bound, then he was released, showing us that God had control over Satan. He allowed him to be bound for a time and released. Satan was released, and he is still tempting people today. But friends, the, one of the most powerful things here is that God has control over Satan. Who bound him and who released him? Satan didn't do that himself. God has power over Satan. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 that even a great man, he has power and control over his own house. And Jesus, because he was able to cast out the demons, to clean out this house, this man who had the demon in him, he showed there, because he was able to cast out demons under Satan's control, he was greater than Satan. There is then in chapter 20, verses 12 through 15, a great judgment scene. God's judgment has been released on Rome. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15, we see this scene of judgment. Notice what the Scripture says. The Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The message is God is going to bring his judgment on Rome. And in so doing, Christians must make sure that their life is right with God. The dead, great and small, regardless of whether they're powerful or weren't, they were judged before God. 
And they had to give an account of their lives to the God of heaven. Friend, if there's a practical application for us, it's this. During times of tribulation and trial, we've got to make sure that if our life is taken, if we do die, that we're ready to stand before the judgment seat of God. We've got to make sure our names are written in the book of life, that we've been living as we ought to, and that the deeds that we've done in this life, we can stand justified before God. Now notice chapter 21 then, encouragement I believe, is given to Christians because here we see a glorious picture, a glorious picture of the church and a glorious picture of heaven, its exalted state of the church. Look in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. To, as encouragement to Christians, John says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. And notice this, God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. To suffering Christians, John says, you hang in there. Heaven's going to be worth it all. And friends, that's a message we need to hear today. No matter what it costs me, no matter how much I have to give up, even if I have to die for the cause of Christ, the place we know of is heaven. Will there be no more sorrow, death, crying, tears, pain? Heaven's truly going to be worth it all. Then John closes the book of Revelation, Jesus does, by instructing us not to add to or take away from the message. Notice Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, directly related to the book of Revelation, God says, Don't you add to or take away. This is essential just the way it is. But friend, there's an overriding message about all of Scripture. Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and be found a liar. Proverbs 30, and verse 6. And so, friend, the, the message of Revelation is, you be true to God. God and his kingdom will rule and reign over all kingdoms. If you remain faithful unto death, the Lord will give us a crown of life. May God bless us as we strive in the midst of trouble and tribulation to be faithful to Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.